Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria, we've got a Bridger rant, not very much news, a mailbag, and lots of table scraps. Stay tuned. Episode number 18, coming right up. Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria right here on the Sound Strategy Network, www.sound-strategy.net. We are, wow. What's what's going on, Mike? <laughs> Hide all the things. Fixing my webcam. Okay. <laughs> well, that just threw me off. We got to do it again. Cut number two. <laughs> no. All right. Let's keep it going here, ladies good. and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. We've got a great show for you today. Despite a astounding lack of news, we're glad you got a hold of the program, however you may have found it. Tell a friend or two, won't you? I'd like to start by quickly making a very important announcement that next week's show will be moved to Monday instead of Sunday. We are doing this for a variety of very technical and important reasons. Most of that being that we will not get any news until Monday the 20th when the NDA for the press sort of comes down. So we're hoping to have a lot of good stuff to talk about for that episode and probably absolutely nothing between now and then. So we're moving it down from Sunday to Monday, same time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and uh, hope everybody gets that message, and we'll see you then on Monday the 20th. Now... Another very important thing that I skipped last week, and I have, uh, uh, I'm feeling very, very much guilt for skipping this for a couple weeks in a row here, but I wanted to throw a quick, uh, very uh, heartfelt thank you to Michael and Patrick for their recent donations to the show. That's going to help us keep the website going uh, for a couple uh, months or so more. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick and Michael. And if you feel like uh, you're the most awesome fan in the world, you can go to TalesOfTeria.com and click the donate button and... That would be great. We'd appreciate it. We'll give you a shout out on the show. And uh, let's move on to uh, introductions. I am Bridger. Hi. How you doing? I'm the host for the show. And with me, as always, we have a, a assorted crew here, but the regular... I'm Bridger. And Kai, <laughs> welcome to the show. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? What have you been doing the last week or so? Playing any good games? I'm good. Um, I got invited to the Terra beta, so I've been playing that, as well as Pokemon World Online beta as well, so it's been a bit of a beta. Whoa, 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 <laughs> whoa. Did you just say something about a Pokemon MMO? <laughs> I did say something about How did I not Pokemon. hear about this? <laughs> I, I watched that on your stream, and I immediately tried to go to the website. Um, Are you trolling me, or is this real? <laughs> no, Pokemon World Online is an indie game. I'm not sure who it's actually made by, but it's basically the original Pokemon on Game Boy, but you play it, and you can see other players running around oh, with Pokemon. Okay. You can PvP battle against other people. There's an auction house. So they took the graphics, and, and they sort of are kludging a game together from the original Game Boy title? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like the it looks exactly like you play Game Boy on a uh, Pokemon on Game Boy. Well, I'm glad really I good. asked you how you were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I never good. heard of this. This sounds like it's breaking all kinds of licenses, but um... without self promotion, I have got a video on it on my YouTube channel if people want to look what it looks like and stuff like that without downloading it. But it is in beta. I believe you have to register on a certain day to get an invite, but I will let people know on Monday if I find out when it is. Okay. Awesome. Yay. Awesome. Freelancer also joining us. Welcome, sir. How's it going? Nothing How's... as excited as uh, Pokemon online. Now. <laughs> <laughs> what are you kill me? You're playing Tribes Ascend. Tribes, man. Yeah, but it's Pokemon, man. Yeah, I mean, it's come Pokemon. on. I know you and can. anybody out there that says they didn't play with Pokemon cards when they were younger, you're lying. I actually didn't play teeth. with Pokemon cards. <laughs> I was too busy into Magic, but I did play the original, obviously. The, old, no. the only Pokemon of the first 150. Screw everything else. 
I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a, I, I liked it before it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> As it hipster, were. Hipster Pokemon. Hipster, hipster. Pokemon Master. <laughs> hipster Pokemon Master. So, so what are we doing nowadays, Bridger? What tribes to send beta, right? Awesome. Yeah. Oof, um, and so League of Legends, that. as always. So, yeah, I, I, I'm so glad about the changes they've been doing the tribes, but we won't go into that. I'm amazed at how fast they're pulling them <laughs> off, honestly. I feel like they, yeah. they must be... They must have put the beta out when they had an internal build that was like six months ahead of time, and they've just been slowly catching us up in just massive, huge patches of changes and stuff. It's just been amazing how fast they've been doing it. But, you know, you do have an MMO studio behind it, <laughs> behind, like, a game with four maps, so they should get those changes pretty quickly. Like a guy in chat's like, Shazbot. <laughs> I know what they're talking about! I'm relevant! No, you're not. It, it right. just brings back that Twitch gaming that I haven't had in so long, and, you know, it's just it's that good feeling it creates. Yeah, Total Biscuit said, you know, this rushers back in maybe the era of fast-paced MMOs, and I retold that to somebody, and, I'm, and they're like, what do you mean? Like, or fast-paced FPSs, and they're like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, you know, you have the Call of Duty-style games that are really slow-paced, and he's like, no, it's not, it's really fast-paced, and I'm like, when a guy's running across the screen at 10, 20, 12 miles an hour... Versus somebody flying across the screen at 200 kilometers 200, an hour. Yeah. <laughs> There's a huge difference in there that you just don't understand. <laughs> you and think you're a sniper. Why don't you try sniping one of these guys flying at 300 kilometers an hour? I hate those guys. I've got the flag. I'm going 200 kilometers. How does he even do that? I'm juking. How do you get me when I'm juking at 200? Okay, that's not a bridge or rant for topic for the show. It's a Guild <laughs> Wars 2 show, ladies game. and gentlemen. We're bringing ourselves back in. Vega, welcome to the show, sir. Hello, good evening. How's it going? It's good, it's good. Have you been doing anything special last week or so? Uh, no, not really. Um, busy with work stuff, but um, just playing Dota 2. Um, not League of Legends, unfortunately. I'd like to... <laughs> I like to play. I like uh, MOBAs before they were cool. Is that you're the you're the uh, the MOBA hipster? No, not at all. I never. I didn't even play the original Dota. Really? Um, you just prefer Dota 2? I started. 2? I started with League of Legends. Interesting. And now I prefer Dota 2. And like I try and go back and play League of Legends, and it's like trying to write left-handed. It's just I can't do it. It just feels so different. <laughs> so. All right, I think that wraps up this uh, Tales of Tales of Tyria's hosts. Uh, let's get into the actual Tales of Tyria. <laughs> so let us talk about a couple things. I've got two links in the show notes, and they're they're not really things to talk about so much as just things that I think you guys, you know, from the last week or so that I've found that I think you guys would like to check out if you're not following the news, what have you. Wooden Potatoes uh, is somebody that we tried to get on the show for our lore event because he has a ton of videos about Guild Wars 1. Just a fantastic collection. So if you want to watch some good stuff about Guild Wars 1, he's got a lot of good stuff in there. But he's been going, pumping out like crazy, huge amounts of videos specifically designed to combat the misconceptions about Guild Wars 2. So whereas a lot of people have been doing Guild Wars 2 info videos, he specifically is making videos to combat specific misconceptions, like no end game question mark exclamation point, or his most recent video, which was discussing the, you know, skill choice. Because a lot of the, you know detractors of Guild Wars 2, we could say, have been throwing around, oh, well, there's no skills in that game, there's only 10, blah, blah, blah. And he goes through a very, very good job of sort of just running down all of the things and pointing out where they're wrong. So, <clears throat> Wooden Potatoes vids, I got a link in the show notes there. You can find those at talesofteria.com, or if you're watching this on YouTube, they should be in the description. Um, also, um, amazing fan-made trailer. Did you guys see this trailer that I linked to here? It's the one that has some wub, wub, wub in the background. Yes, I did. Very. Yeah, There's I watched it. Was been going around recently, so I'm not sure which one it is, but yeah, let me. We had two linked on Team Legacy. I think that's the second one. This is the one that um, starts by looking at the different races and showing the... Uh, yeah, this is the one has... with a little bit of dubstep mixed in yeah. and all that. Yeah, it was really well done. I mean, it's using the same footage as every other trailer out there, but oh, yeah. the way this guy compiled it was was really neat. So. Oh, yeah, I do remember seeing this because I remember that the beginning bit, 250 years after, blah, blah, and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool, and then watched the whole thing. Yeah, it was good. Yep. I enjoyed it. <clears throat> Huge fan of that. And uh, let's see, that is, I guess, the news slash links portion of the show here because we really don't have much to talk about, as it were. Um, so let me open up the next piece. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, yes. <clears throat> so 
I have been reading a lot of posts on the Guild Wars 2 Reddit and other places, and one caught my eye. It's called Guild Wars 2 World v. World v. World Reward System. What I'm wondering is if we'll see any kind of character progression. <laughs> and immediately, I get this tick when people say character progression, and then... You know, somebody saying these points, blah, blah, blah. And some people are making the comments like, yeah, well, it better have some good rewards because I don't think I'm going to play it if it doesn't have any good rewards. And I'm just getting, oh, I'm just getting so angry. There's a vault, there's a, there's a vein in my head that may explode. And, you know, when I get a little upset, I got to vent. And when I vent, it's called a bridge rant. Ladies and gentlemen, that's right. This is, I think, the result of World of Warcraft teaching the wrong things. There's a Gama Sutra article about this written by David Serlin, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna shamelessly kinda take his points. Point number one. Investing a lot of time in something is worth more than somebody who's very good at something. Because that's what World of Warcraft teaches you, ladies and gentlemen. If you start the game and play for ten hours and get pretty good at how your character works, somebody who spent 300 hours and has epic gear and is level 85 is gonna wipe the floor with you that's not the way it works in every other game in the world if i play counter-strike for the first 10 hours and i'm really good at first person shooters and i pick up the game real quick and i get headshots and i know what's going on i'm gonna kick your ass i don't care if you played 300 hours if i'm better than you i'm better than you all right that's that's one thing and then there's people like these people in the world of uh, the world v world thread that say Things like, you know, well, I, I, I just, I want to have something to work for. It's not fun unless I have something to work for. Work for winning the game, man! Come on! That's the goal! That's, you don't need a carrot to be dangled in front of you. There, there, there's, there's a whole objective! Capture the castles! Capture the mines! Help your server win! And I'm not saying there shouldn't be one of these things, but some people are just demanding. I deserve better armor because I am, uh, I should deserve an advantage because I've played longer. That attitude, I can't stand it. I just can't stand it. So time is greater than skill. That's just a fundamental pet peeve of mine that I just can't get over. Now there's another thing. There's another thing in this article that just drives me insane. And I didn't know that it drove me insane until I read this article, which is a weird connection, but the terms of service and the way that World of Warcraft uses them... Oh, my head. They do things like they say in the terms of service, here's what you can't do or your character will get banned. So what you're saying is, you've got this rule that you'd like us to follow. I... Dang, it, if only there were a way that you could, you know, write this into the game. Some kind of code that could prevent people from doing the thing you don't want them to do! You have control of the code! Why don't you just make it impossible? You write the rules for this world! Why, Blizzard? Why would you say, okay, we're just gonna let people do this, but we're we're gonna then warn them and then ban them if they do it? That's like that's like God saying you have free will, but if you do something bad, I'm gonna send you to hell. Well, I guess I don't have a real choice then, do I? Why didn't you just prevent me from doing it in the first place? All right, I just took this to the wrong place, but man, I can't stand it when you use terms of service to and to, to completely, completely tell people what they can and can't do. Just put it in the game. That's lazy. Am I wrong? Well, Blizzard has been doing <laughs> this a very long time, so. And that makes it okay because they've spent a lot of time doing it and they deserve to be lazy about programming. You, you, you obviously, <laughs> Bridger, you haven't been around the internet long enough to know that Blizzard is all internet, is all being. Okay, you don't <laughs> defy a blizzard and you don't make them mad. <laughs> so when when you don't get your StarCraft three invite, Bridger, I, I will <laughs> refer you back to this episode. <laughs> this is like <laughs> this is like Leo out. Laporte on this week in tech saying something bad about Apple and getting banned. No, what it was, he actually filmed the Apple like keynote 
Nobody told him he couldn't, but apparently he wasn't supposed to, and he got on their crap list forever. Oh, man. But, yeah, and to clarify, I don't mind aesthetic rewards. Making your character look badass because you've done something that few other people have done, that's cool. I love that idea. But the idea that some people feel entitled to some major advantage because they've spent more time with a game just drives me up the wall. You should be getting an advantage because you're better skilled and have more experience and more knowledge, but... I almost got started again. But, I'm sorry. But is that not <laughs> why Guild Wars 1 was so awesome? I mean, think exactly. about it. Exactly. You know? I mean, if you got into the GVG, like, I'm going through doing HOM right now. I don't claim to be a big Guild Wars person, but I'm following Malk here. He's been helping us out and a couple of the other big guys. And the coolest thing I, I still, like, as I'm grinding Ruby, um, uh, flip, I just massacred the name, Jade Quarry, um, is that. No matter what I do, whether I'm playing two hours a day or whether I'm playing, you know, 200 hours a day like these other guys, my character is the ex it has the same capability as Azur does, and I love that. And I hope they carry that on the Guild Wars 2. So far, they have. Whew. Well, I like right. when they described Guild Wars 1, they said it's a game about, you know, <laughs> skills, not gear. Mm -hmm. So it's always good. That's pretty much true. All right. <clears throat> Now I feel better. Okay, so we got a mailbag <laughs> this week. Uh, Bailden, who I think is actually in the chat, sent us something via maybe an email. I don't remember where this came in. A possible topic to address in a future show could be the methods of storytelling. How do you tell stories in MMOs, and could it be any better? How does the unique structure of Guild Wars 2 gameplay allow for improved storytelling? So... There's a very interesting comparison to be made here, too, because you don't want to just look at MMOs for inspiration on how to tell a, uh, how to do really good storytelling. The first thing that popped to mind when I thought of how do you use, for example, for, I mean, with, when it comes to gaming, freelancer, what makes gaming different than other methods of storytelling? Uh, I mean, for example, you could put a full motion video in the middle of a game, and then you'd be telling a story like Hollywood. Or you could put a bunch of quest text in a game, and then you'd be telling a story like a book. How do you tell a story like a game? I think that's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's uh, you get to make the actions in between the story, you know. You change your outcome. Um, BioWare's been doing it great for the last, you know, so many years with Dragon Age, et cetera, Mass Effect. Um, storytelling and gaming in general is is what makes it so much different is you get to direct the the story itself. Whereas if you're reading a book or watching a movie, you can't control what goes on. You're mm -hmm. screaming at the screen, don't don't turn that corner, you know, <laughs> or, or if it's a horror movie, you know, you know what's about to happen. Whereas oh my God, in, he's in the closet! <laughs> <laughs> you know, in a game, you, uh, in a good game, any decent game, uh, RPGs in general, you get to kind of determine the outcome of the story. If I want to be the 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 prick that goes around treating everybody badly, well, chances are the story is going to wrap around that idea. Or if I want to be the uh, chauvinistic, you know, holy warrior that saves everybody's lives and gives lollipops to children, you know, the story will center around that too. And and that's what it's all about. Yep, yep, I agree. Uh, <clears throat> Kai uh, Vega, any thoughts? Um, I kind of feel like that. Um. I like having sort of the cutscenes that sort of help immerse you a little bit more. It's not, when I when I think of a cutscene in a in a video game, I don't necessarily think of it as a Hollywood way to describe the story, um, because you're still playing the game up until that cutscene, and that cutscene is just sort of, you know, I think it 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 it's a little bit stronger than just reading you know some text out of a book or something like that. And I feel that, um, I mean, even in Guild Wars 1, they had some pretty decent cutscenes that helped make things feel a little bit more important and a little bit more real. And they're just nicer to look at. And I feel that that helps a lot when it comes to storytelling, especially in MMOs, because MMOs in general, um, they've never really been about, you know, storytelling. You know, there's lore there and there's things going on in the world, but... Um, you know, it's kind of hard to bring a player into that world and make them feel so important when there's so many other people around. Um, but I feel that having cutscenes does that, and I think that what Guild Wars 2 is doing and trying to kind of have a more personalized story and everything will help sort of bring that out. To me, <clears throat> I'm thinking cutscenes work fantastic for things like established events, like sort of flashbacks, for example. If something's already happened, it's already, 
you know, referred to, you know, that time your character got shot or whatever, then you can flash back to that and show sort of um, the the backstory of that particular event. But <clears throat> to me, I, I I really look to gaming as like Freelancer said, that your choices and what you do and you are experiencing the story. You're not watching someone else experience it like in a movie. You're not reading about somebody else's experience. You are experiencing it. And I think the company that does that, you know, almost better than anyone else is Valve. Look at Half-Life. You never have any situation in that game. Half-Life 1 or Half-Life 2 doesn't matter. You are always in first person. You never get pulled out to a cutscene to see your character. You are the character. You are experiencing what's happening. And that's the idea behind that decision. They're one of the only game companies that I can remember that have made that decision. We will never have a third-person cutscene or anything like that. This is all first-person, everything that happens to you. Now, that is a very difficult thing to pull off. That's why not too many people do it. Because you have to draw the, the player's attention to things to allow them to figure out what's going on. The other thing that they do, and this is something that they sort of elaborated on again, if you read like the, uh, the Left 4 Dead uh, developer notes that they had, they'll, they'll point out the story that they tell through the world that they've built. Like Left 4 Dead, the story of that game is the story of what happens to your characters as you're playing through it. There's no set story. Whereas many other games have this linear story where it's just like, okay, this is going to happen. Bioware gets away with having a couple different story threads that you could maybe do based on your character's actions. In Left 4 Dead, the story of the game is literally what you do. Oh man, we were, we were running down towards the bridge and then all of a sudden the smoker grabbed my leg and started pulling me back as a jockey hit, hit my friend, my friend uh, you know, Francis and Francis got pulled over to the side and, but then it was okay because Coach came and saved everybody. I don't know why Coach is there with Francis, but you get the idea. The story of the game is literally what happens to your characters, and very few other games will do that. They'll have a set story, and that's the story, but this one said, we won't have any external story. We'll have a story of what happened to the world, and you can see that, and looking around, they point out, like, you have a body on the ground covered in a sheet. That body tells a story. It means that when that person died, there were other people around that didn't have enough time to bury the person, but did have enough time to at least give them a little dignity and cover them with a sheet. So that kind of detail in the world is something that ArenaNet is known for and something I'm very much looking forward to in Guild Wars 2 to bring it all the way back around. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's then. one of the... Well, it's, it's one of those things... I mean, story is, is part of a game, though. I mean, it's... It's how they incorporate that story with gameplay. Some some games, I mean, how many of us can name games where it was so focused on the story that the gameplay just kind of fell on the wayside? <laughs> I mean, we all know those games. And JRPGs! I think, uh, <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's, we could talk about story, but for, for a lot of people, gameplay takes a big aspect of that, too. And I think if ArenaNet combines the two... Um, we should be looking at a good game. And another thing ArenaNet's doing that's kind of nice is, what if you're not a story guy? I mean, we're just looking at chat here, some people, they just don't care about story. Mm -hmm. You know, they just want to skip past it. Well, it, like in, in many MMOs, you know, you could sort of skip past that as well. ArenaNet provides tutorials outside the story, and I think that's a big thing to note because some games focus so much on the story that they teach you how to play the game through the story. And if you skip it or you don't bother with it, then you end up with these mass amounts of people afterwards or that just don't know what they're doing. Somehow you know? the writers got an influence with the with the UI designer and said, no, no, don't put a skip button in there. They have to see this. <laughs> I know what's good for them. They have to. I don't care if they've played it before and they don't like this cutscene. They must see it again. <laughs> I spent a lot of time writing that. Ugh. That's another, somebody, that's another somewhere, Richard rant entirely. Somebody somewhere gets paid big bucks for you guys to watch these cinematics. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope all of you lose sleep at night for every time you skip them. <laughs> that's that's right. one thing about me is that I generally play games for the experience of playing. I've never really been into lore. Before Guild Wars 2, I didn't ever read the lore or the history behind games. And I played all the way through World of Warcraft, not even knowing that the Lich King was in Warcraft 3. Like, I was literally completely oblivious as to what was going on. And I was just like, yeah, we kill this dude. Like, I don't care who he is. Don't care who he's related to. And I just did it because I enjoyed <laughs> playing the game. But 
I think Guild Wars 2, because of the way they have the, like, the history and the war of Guild, the law even of Guild Wars 1, and then obviously you've got the Guild Wars 2, like, law and history as well that's, like, happening, I think it makes me want to know what's going on because it's such a big difference, and you're now a part of this big happening with the Elder Dragons and things like that, so it's kind of bringing me in to want to know about the history and the law by, you know, various cinematics and hopefully, like, text that I can read as well. I think the other thing that, that Guild Wars 2 is kind of doing right, and that is sort of what I was talking about before, is the dynamic event system, by its very design, is going to have you experiencing the story instead of reading about it, or instead of someone telling you about it, or instead of seeing a cutscene. When you approach a village, you will see that it's under attack. You don't have to walk into the village and then have someone tell you that it's under attack. You get to experience it. You get to see it. You get to sort of run with the centaurs, as it will. Uh, and, <laughs> and so that, I think, is going to be a very powerful storytelling experience. I really predict that people are going to get a lot more invested and interested in what's going on in the world of Guild Wars 2 than they ever have in any other MMO that didn't have this kind of system. And and that, I think, is, is going to be, obviously, a, a prediction to find out for later, but I think that's something that we're going to see. I, I think also that, um, because, I mean, like, like, Warhammer had the dynamic events, which were fun, but I think the big major difference, and however subtle it might be, is that the dynamic events actually change, you know, the centaurs are attacking the village. If you succeed in the dynamic event, the village is saved, and now you have to defend it. If you fail, now the centaurs make a camp, and now you have another dynamic event to take that camp. So now I think that a whole big part of the whole storytelling aspect is that when you go back to a place, it's not just, oh, now I see the centaurs running there again. Now you can see how things have changed, how they've progressed, if the village is there or not. And I think that the fact that when you can go to a place and see different things happening as if the world is changing around you helps tremendously in having the storytelling and be a part of it. And you know it's great? Go ahead. So on top of that, I think as well, like you can play exactly the same route as your friend, but they can experience completely different dynamic events on the way. So when you go through like an hour earlier, you've defended the village and, you know, you saved it. You've gone on to the next area, done a different dynamic event. But when they've come along, the centaurs have already made camp in the village and they've got to try and take it back. So I think two people can play the same route but have a completely different experience. So they get their own story and you might never experience that first dynamic event because you might not go back there and see the the centaurs are there so i think that's really good so it depends on you've got to be in the right place at the right time and like you do get a completely different story to other people i wonder if we should rename it to centaur war 2 <laughs> because <laughs> every single that's example anybody it. ever uses i mean i always do the same thing it's always about the centaurs. Well, you know what's the, nice? You know what's nice about it though is that they're not force feeding you lore when they do that. You know, they're giving you just the amount of lore that you need to know to understand the what's going on. You know, you know that there's these centaurs, these being in parentheses, and that they're doing, they're attacking this village and stuff. But they don't. Some games, this is this is what I was kind of was getting at. Some games will make you sit there for five minutes to read the background history of these centaurs and why you should stop them. You know, they provide that. ArenaNet has that history. They have those brilliant writers that that write all of that, but they don't make you have to know that in order to play the game. And I'm, I think I'm a lot of people though, would appreciate they, that. They've probably wormed that into the dynamic events by like for example if you save the town and you go to get your karma reward from the guy who said oh thank you for saving the town blah 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 you could probably question him like oh who are these centaurs what are they doing blah 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 and then he'll sort of lead you you know you could you could quickly sort of click through his things and say oh he's leading you to the next part of the quest which is they they're over there go get them or you could you know he could tell you about their backstory if you wanted to know we'll, we'll see if that's if that's the true but i'm i'm guessing that We'll see something like that. The thing that always strikes me is that when it comes to these kind of storytelling, subtlety. If you can get a lot across by saying a little, you've succeeded when it comes to storytelling. It's really all about subtlety. You don't want to hammer somebody over the head and say, you know, have an entire explanation of somebody, oh, your character doesn't remember anything about the world? Let me walk you through it. Like, nobody wants to hear that. They want to <laughs> They want to figure out what's going on around them by living it, you know? So, I, I, I want... I, go ahead. Oh, 
Um, I, I think also kind of comparing, again, Guild Wars and WoW. In WoW, I feel that you have to go out of your way to sort of, like, read the quests and know what's going on, whereas in Guild Wars 2, it feels like through the dynamic events, you don't have to read a single thing. You could just partake and play the game, and you're still going to get a sense of what's going on around mm -hmm. you. It's not like World of Warcraft where you, you get a quest. I, I've never read a single quest thing besides what you have to have done. So I have no idea what's going on. So, you know, I go to the field and I kill some boar, or I do this or I do that, but I have no idea what the story is there. All I know is, is that I need to do this to get that done. And it's, it's, it's a nice sort of way that, that they're doing it because they're not forcing you to, to partake in it. But if you want to go the extra effort and find out what's really going on, it's a lot more rewarding. Yeah, you know, it's I, think great. I think they did the same in Guild Wars 1 as well, though, to be honest, because I never read the quest text, really, unless I was stuck on a quest. And the, just the cutscenes that they had and the quests that I did in the interaction with the NPCs, I got quite a good story about, like, the white mantle and things like that. And I think I know a little bit about the Guild Wars 1 lore now, whereas when I started, I knew nothing, and I've not done any extra reading or the quest text at all. So I think they kind of already had a concept of that in Guild Wars 1, and obviously they've improved it now for Guild Wars 2, hopefully. Freelancer? No, I was just going to hit on what Vega was saying there. I mean, the biggest biggest thing everybody in that we're all discussing this now that we're all going to notice is in WoW, if, I, if I'm if i in, um, uh, of course, I've, I haven't played in now six months. <laughs> if I'm in that Dwarven Gnome starting area and I'm killing those darn, <laughs> darn boars at level one and two, you all know what I'm talking about. Don't lie and say you don't. Um, <laughs> it's, we know. Uh, yeah, it's... You you kill him, you kill him, you kill him, and then yet they're still there. And then you go up to this guy and you turn in a quest, right? And he's like, oh, thank you, you got rid of my problem. And <laughs> then you look out in the field and they're all just menacingly staring at you still. It's you know? those it's kind like... of disconnects. <laughs> yeah. Karen is Dunmurrow. And uh, an arena that is promising, for the most part, to to change that to where if I go and kill, if I do have those quests, where I have to kill these centaurs or whatever it might be, because we're using the centaur. Kill ten meter, rats, kill ten kobolds, whatever. Then they're dead. They're dead. You know, yep. I don't have to do it again unless the the public quest cycle spins back around. So exactly. You know, but anyways, move on. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yep. So Tough let's. Story. Let's move on to the table scraps portion of our show. This is not, uh, these are topics that are not quite enough for the, a round table in their own respect, but uh, we're going to talk about it nonetheless. Now, this is something that somebody suggested, something uh, for us as a whole group to make predictions of various natures, and then maybe a month after release, we'll sort of see how right we were on various topics. So I made a list here, and we'll, we'll go one by one. Um, so... Let's start with Kai. What do you think the most played class will be by everybody? All, out of all the people in the world, who's gonna? What, what's the most played class? A month after Elementalist. release. Elementalist. Elementalist. Yeah. All right. What is going to be your most played class? Like, what do you it, 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 picture yourself playing the most? Elementalist. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I'm seeing a trend. All right. Most played. <laughs> Or, or, you know, favorite... Yeah, what's the most played race by the general uh, population? That's really hard because I just can't picture... Like, I'm trying to get Guild Wars 2 target audience, and I think, okay, think of the mind of the Guild Wars 2 population and what they're going to play, and I cannot pick it. I'm actually really looking forward to seeing, like, a widespread of races because in games like World of Warcraft, people always pick, like night elves or blood elves so you know, there's quite like a diff like a big gap between the different races and how many people play them whereas i think in guild of two it's going to be equal i really think that there's a lot of people who want to play char and there's a lot of people who want to play sora and norn and silvari so i think it's going to be even all around bridger she's trying to say she's choosing silvari well, yeah. <laughs> i think you gotta pick one without trying to sound cliche i'm playing a silvari like every single one of my characters going to be a Silvari. I'm going to make a human just to go see like Divinity's Reach, but that's it. Like Silvari all the way. All right, but I think right. everyone else would be equal. Freelancer, <laughs> most played class and by, by everyone and then by yourself. What do you think? Uh, by everyone, it'll definitely be the Elementalist because it's the simplest. <laughs> I still disagree. What do you think your most played class is It is the class simplest is class. Be? People will aim towards it because they think they can go pew pew dead and you heard it right now. That will be massively overruled because that's just 
it, the mechanics are very straightforward. Not I want to play it though. I want to play. You won't argue that to the. Well, that's fine. But I'm saying. I think it's one of the most class. one of the most interesting complex classes because you have yeah, so I... much available to you at any given moment to know but... which of those twenty spells to use. You, it's going to take a lot of experience. It's going to take a lot of experience on which things I can spam the fastest. I mean, it's you don't have the the detailed mechanics that you do with the other. And this is this is the freelancer opinion, okay? But it is a simple <laughs> class. I've gone over the wiki. I've seen the videos. It, all you have to do is judge what abilities are attacking, what abilities aren't attacking, what abilities heal you, and that's all the elementalist has to worry about. You don't have to worry about positioning. You don't have to worry about as much as other classes. Let me stop right there. <laughs> as, uh, <laughs> Because I, I could already see the backlash. <laughs> and, and no, I'm not trolling the community, but it's it's a simple concept. It is there just for the co for the players that want to know, this is my attack skill, this is my heal skill, and that's all the class is about. I, I respectfully I like disagree with you. Skills, though. Yeah, there's like 80 yeah. something I, I, you can use. All right, I think Freelancer, agree what are you... What are you going to be playing the most, you think? I will be playing the most complicated class, which is oh. that of the... What is it? Thief? Thief. No. Mesmer. Mesmer. Thief is the Twitch class. Mesmer. Mesmer. Tw thief is the Twitch class, and the Thief will be very quickly downplayed by nearly all classes in World vs. World, basically because he's focused around melee for the most part. And the stealth mechanics and stuff, <laughs> who cares about stealth when there's... 20 guys there that'll be spamming AoEs and all sorts of other stuff and knock you out of stuff. So, like all other MMOs, and I'm saying this because I hope ArenaNet proves me wrong, range classes will dominate. Thief is out of the game. It's just that simple. Alright, Vega. What's the most played class a month out? Most played class, I am going to say Guardian. Really? Mm. Yes. Interesting choice. Because that's, everyone that's said cool. elementalist, and I got to be different. <laughs> but on okay. my guilds, we did like a poll, like who's going to play the most class, and Guardian came first. I was shocked. Like elementalist was like third, and I was like, okay, people just clearly aren't voting, but <laughs> like seriously, pe people really want to play the Guardian. I, I think really people, do. I think people are going to make a Guardian because um, I, I'm. They're going to think, think Paladin. They think Paladin. Yeah, they're gonna yeah. think it's a Paladin. It is um, kind of a Paladin. It is a Paladin. It is. It is, it is a Paladin. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, Guardian. I myself am playing Engineer. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb, and I'm gonna say Mesmer. I think there was a huge, huge amount of like, oh, I can't wait for the Mesmer from everybody. I think Mesmer is gonna be the most played class, um, and I am going to think that I'm gonna be playing an Elementalist. Yay! See. There, I could tell you right now, the least played class is going to be Engineer, like it was in every other MMO that implemented that kind of class. Because mm -hmm. the Engineer is the jack of all trades, but good at absolutely nothing. Except defending <laughs> a single location. But it, you're, it, <laughs> like, nobody you in their right mind in PvP should be dis defending a single location. Your what are you best talking about? defense, Sandbag your best engineer. defense, is a highly mobile and effective offense. Yes, and the other exactly four people make up that is. part. That is Can exactly I say, what we're looking is. at? Did you see the engineer PvP video? He was flying all over the map. <laughs> yeah. He... It just PvP though. Someone might specifically want the engineer for PvE reasons and might hate PvP and think this what, is all void. What's, what's what's PvE? What what, what is that? Oh, <laughs> <God>. <laughs> all right, freelancer. What's the most played race? Uh, that's gonna be easy, Savari. Um, Savari or Asira, just because everybody likes to troll, and Asira are great at doing that, I'm sure. So you're going to have a, a huge base on Savari and Asira. Guarantee it. All right. What do you think there, Vega? Most played race. Um, most played race. Uh, I don't want to say Savari, so. <laughs> you can say Savari. We, if <laughs> we all say... are right, then we all then the whole the, the podcast as a whole wins, right? Um. I, but I feel like it's going to be a toss-up between Savari and Asura, so I'm going to go with Asura. That's also which I want to play myself, so. Hmm. I'm thinking, I'm thinking human. But you know, I was, I'm also I was thinking gonna... of Silvari. I just, it's I hard to Char think. I think Char as well. Like, Char are the big bad enemies. I don't think, I think Char one. are going to be the... Mm. The Char, see, Char have one thing going against them, and that's that every player playing them, I don't know if anybody... Uh, 
understands this, but when you're playing a large character in an MMO or in a shooter or, or whatever it might be, you always seem like you're slower and more sluggish, and it's not so much fun then. Where Char our big head mode. Yeah, it, it's one of those <laughs> things that if you're playing, you're going to feel like you're moving slower than normal, and you're really not. But then you go and play this. You're... Or you or in WoW you played the gnome and you always felt like you were super quick doing things. <laughs> I because think that their little legs that move so fast. <laughs> <laughs> I think naturally that's going to make people kind of stay away from the char and uh, unfortunately because the char by far, uh, not talking about who's going to be playing them the most, but they are the coolest race ever. They and are. They've got a lot of good lore. I think. Yeah. To me, I think the char fit with the fewest classes. Like, in people's minds. Like, a char is going to make a warrior awesome. Tons of people are going to make char warriors. Tons of people are going to make char engineers. Maybe a few people make char elementalists or mesmers. But, and maybe necromancers. But a char thief? Eh, I don't know. A char guardian? Maybe not so much. Could be. I just, they don't, see, they don't fit in with the racial kind of lore quite as well as the other classes. Silvari, well, though, I think Silvari, Mesmer, and Elementalist, great, but anything else, and then maybe a Ranger, but a, a Silvari warrior, like you, a plant wearing met, like <laughs> plate armor, like if no you leather like, armor, like leather armor, a plant wearing meat, it's great. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, like a Sora, a Sora engineer is, uh, you know, oxymoron because the Asura are all like magical and they're all wizards. engineers. <laughs> they're all engineers. Yeah, but they're like, but they're on like a higher level than. What yeah, it's like class techno really level. All right, freelancer. Most class labeled. Not necessarily the one that is, oh, but the class labeled as most OP. I think right now everybody's saying, everybody is saying the thief is OP. But really? uh, that's, that's throughout the forums and stuff. On Guru, everybody's been reading these threads. But we really can't call this before the game. But if judging from the current videos without seeing the Mesmer... But I'm not asking what uh, one is OP. Just the one that many people will say, oh, uh, that's OP. Uh, probably the most gimmicky one, which would be Mesmer. Okay. Vega, what do you think? Most um, OP. Most perceived for me, as most yeah, OP. It's a, it's a toss-up between Elementalist and Necro, but I'm going to go with Necro. 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 All right, Kai, what do you think? Class labeled think as most OP. Yeah, definitely Elementalist. Everyone seems to think that's going to be crazy OP. I'm actually thinking um, Elementalist as well. Did you, uh, you read the um, your Guild Wars 2 Insider uh, question where the guy mentioned uh, in reference to the Elementalist Tornado being OP. You read what the developer responded to that, right? Yeah, he, uh, he basically pointed out how you could kite around it and things like that. That's that's the thing, though. I think a month out, there's still going to be those misconceptions. They're going to see things like yeah. the Elementalist Tornado. The Elements has so many tools that people aren't going to understand what the limitations of those tools are. They're going to go up against a Staff Elementalist, and he's going to just destroy four people with his giant AoE thing, and they're not going to understand that a Staff Elementalist doesn't have very many single target abilities. So if you manage to go after him one-on-one, -on -one, you're not going he's not going to be able to outdamage you. It's only when he's in a team fight and he's protected with other people. So those, because the Elementalist has so many skills, it's going to take time for people to understand how to beat him. So I think the Elementalist is going to be labeled as OP first, even if he isn't actually OP. But see, the Elementalist has straightforward skills. Uh, throughout history, it's always, the people that always cry OP about something is uh, a class or a a weapon that has mechanics they don't understand that's outside the norm see you know an elementalist that comes at you is going to do damage a lot of damage very fast very efficiently because that's what he does whereas if he kills you and stuff you're just going to say oh particular skills are overpowered or i just need to stay out of range or you're going to put these preconceptions in your head that that's what you need to do to prevent it later on and it's not so OP, you just need to learn it whereas you got classes like the Engineer uh, Mesmer's a great example Guardian even, has these skills that are so new to the MMO genre the mechanics of them are so different you know, the Mesmer comes in, you think you're about to hit the Mesmer, the next thing you know he teleports 20, you know, 20 yards behind you and you go after what you think is him again, turns out to be his clone, then he's on the other side of you again and before you know it you're dead and you didn't die from just pure damage. You died to all of these gimmicky type moves. Psychological and, yeah, problems. I psychological <laughs> warfare. And that's what the players will be screaming OP about. And whether it's true or not, it's 
No, but I I kind of disagree because I feel that in in many other games like I don't know, like StarCraft or Dota or League of Legends that a lot of times that the the a lot of characters that are called OP are the ones that are stupidly simple but yet do so much damage. Like how many times have you played StarCraft and you just get stomped by someone who just masses marines or you're playing you're playing like a team game and all they do is just mass marines and but they that's just not OP. Over you. The it's people that the but people, people that, call it OP. I, yeah, but those are also the same people the rest of us laugh at. I mean, it's there's there's ways to get around everything and something as simple as mass marine. Well, we're getting way off Guild Wars 2 here, but <laughs> yeah, but but, but it's something as simple a as a times, hammer to the face. But but a lot of times <laughs> that the the it's sometimes the simple things that people still call OP. Because it's so simple and yet it's it's still so That's effective. actually kind of true because people get frustrated when they're beaten by things that they think they should be able to figure out how to beat. And if yeah. they can't figure it out because it's so simple, like Zerg Rush. Like, I should know how to beat a Zerg Rush, but if I get beaten by one, I throw my keyboard against the wall. But if somebody beats me with a very, you know, calculated, you know, thing where they, they come into the back of my base via some airdrop, whatever, then I have to be like, well played. But if I get beat by a Zerg Rush, man, I'm kicking myself for the rest of the day. You know what I mean? I could see that. I could see I that. I think that someone said this to me. I can't remember who, but... um. Basically said that all of the Guild Wars 2 classes have the ability to be overpowered. Therefore, I mean, it reminds me in chat, someone just said that therefore they all become kind of equal because <laughs> they all have abilities that seem overpowered. Therefore, it's all balanced, really, because, I mean, every single class has that one thing that's going to be tricky to kind of overcome and things like that. But hopefully it is balanced. Actually, that's an interesting... I, okay, I got to add a new, a new question here. <laughs> which class is going to be labeled the noob cannon class? Like, just like, you know, like hunters in WoW, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. play less, guy, come on. Like, okay, so which class is going to be labeled the noob class? The noob I think class. it's going to be what? It's going to be ranger? ranger. You think? <laughs> it's it's going to be ranger. I mean, come on. <laughs> ranger is so cookie cutter and just so generic. I honestly think Vega. What, what do you about think? Warrior. 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 You think that's going to be labeled the noob class? I think noob, noob class, noob class, but not in a set, not a noob cannon class, like stupidly easy and could still do a lot of damage. But noob class in that it's simple yet effective. Noob class in like a nice way. I don't want to piss off too many people. I think somebody somebody <laughs> else had the point. It, it, somebody else in the chat said, uh, "Let me see. Hang on. Where the heck is it? Oh man, I can't find it." I scrolled past it already. It was uh, something to the effect of if turrets do more than one damage every minute, it'll be called a noob weapon or it will be called OP. Uh, there we go. Corrupt Drop Bear said that. And I, I have to agree with him. Anybody who gets killed by a turret is going to think to themselves, damn it, that engineer didn't actually kill me. His turret did it. Therefore, he's a noob. Like, he's just <laughs> dropping turrets, which are doing all the work for him. So I think engineer. I don't. I don't know if this what, is going to be. What does that say about the player that got killed by the turret? I agree with you. <laughs> you have this problem in League of Legends where people get killed by Teemo's mushroom. They're like, oh, bloody mushroom! It's like, well, I placed the mushroom. You ran into it. You're the noob. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Kai right. sounds like she speaks from some pretty deep experience there. Yeah, Teemo player, right? <laughs> All right, so. Teemo. I hate you. So Vega. You hate him because you run into his mushrooms, though. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> she admits it. Okay. All right. So Vega, what do you think you will be doing a month after release? What are you doing the most? Are you doing world versus world? Are you doing PvP? Are you doing dynamic events? Um, are you are you messing around in the auction house? Like, what's got your focus after a month? Not the auction house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you crafting? make me sad. I mean, I'll, we'll, we'll put I the non-combat stuff the, all into its own category. The auction house, but not until like later, probably. But um, I'm just not a big auction house person. But a month after release, um, I think the whole world vs. world is probably uh, what I'd probably be focusing on. Okay. World vs. world and dynamic events. That's what I'm most interested in. What do you think you're gonna be doing a month after release? 
It what? sounds really cheesy, but I'm one of these people that likes to literally do everything in a game. So I'll spend like an hour on Yorkshire House undercutting people, trying to earn as much money <laughs> as possible. And then I'll spend collecting um, companion pets or I'll do mini games or PvP. I really like to like spread my time out and about rather than just focusing on one thing. So I t like to immerse myself and just experience everything really. But I reckon I'll spend a lot of time in Worldly World. Definitely. That'll take up a lot of time. I swift pones in in the chat room says after a month I'll be getting the last achievement. <laughs> well that is very swift ponage, I have to agree. He lives up to his name, were that to be true. Um so what do you think you're gonna be doing the most of? <laughs> I missed your prediction. What do you think, Kai? Label it down um, to one. What's the thing that you're one doing thing the most? The most I think will be world. Alright, freelancer. Well, while Kai is doing her uh, immersion, <laughs> I will. For those I not will be, watching the video, I will he be just put it in air in quotes her base, for you. taking all of her keeps <laughs> and, <laughs> or in her world. Your base, like to us. Uh, and um, yeah, it's gonna be world versus world. I mean, I'll be doing the auction house and stuff uh, probably while I'm at work and stuff. So, uh, I'll be uh, doing the world versus world when I get home. I mean, a month into the game, uh, as far as my own guild, we're already going to be done all the dynamic stuff. So it'll just be grinding out world versus world with the um, with the ranking system and stuff they're doing with servers versus servers. I think that's really exciting, and I think that um, I think guilds such as ours and there's many many others to be sure will be leading their servers to become kind of a brand name, and I think that'll be the big big discussion for everybody i think a month from now and as far as the communities our podcast uh all sorts of different um publications people will be talking about the servers that are organizing the best against other servers yeah. and i i think that'll be the big discussion so that's where everybody's going to be and if you weren't interested in world versus world before when you start seeing all that promotion and all of that talk you know oh my god we're, we're faced up against uh freelancer server oh my god you know or or, <laughs> or kai server you know oh my what are we gonna do now you know i i think that is the the greatest feeling to to have that notoriety and also be the one that just crushes other servers and that's that's where i'll be living all right i think <laughs> server for crushing. me yes, yes. What's going to happen in a month? Server crushing. <laughs> so I think for me, I'm definitely going to be dabbling in all of it because I have to because I host this podcast. So I'm supposed to know everything. So I literally have to go, Dah. I have to do all the things. But I think at the beginning of the game, I'm going to be doing a lot of the – like first week, I'm going to be with Team Legacy doing World vs. World like just nonstop. All the world versus world, getting all the good stuff, making sure our server is known as the best, obviously. Because I'm going to have that whole week off because I'm taking vacation when Guild Wars 2 comes out. <laughs> so that's totally happening. But, so question, question, Bridger. What are you telling your boss? I told him I was going to play Guild Wars 2 because I always just podcast. He's an awesome <laughs> boss. He lets me play trains at work. It's great. I hope my his boss's boss isn't watching. All right, no. Um, so, yeah, no. I just, hey, it's my vacation time. I can use it when I want. Dang it. I don't care what he thinks. So, yeah, yeah. That's what I said. Um, <laughs> it's like checking your viewers right now. To... He's not listening, is he? Uh, so, no. Anyway, um, so I think I'm going to be doing tons of World versus World during that. And after that, I'm going to have to check out a lot of the other stuff that's going on in the game. And before I jump in, like, really into the deep end of the structured PvP, which I'm sure I'm going to be playing it somewhat in the first month or so, but I think... I'll, I'm going to want to learn my character while I'm leveling it up through the personal story and the, and the dynamic events and exploring the world because that's something I love to do. And by the time I get to 80 with one or two or three characters, there's going to be plenty of time to just spend all day in World vs. World, all day in structured PvP. But I want to be learning my different various classes. So I'm going to have like... All the classes I'm going to have a character for, and I'm going to just decide, I want to learn a little bit more about the Necromancer today. So I'll play through the Necromancer and level that up a little bit and sort of do the personal story. So I think that's where I'm going to be after a month. I'm still going to be in the process of learning all of the classes as I'm going, and then once I get, you know, the, the, the majority of them uh, leveled up to a decent level, then I'm going to be taking them all into, uh, you know, structured PvP and that kind of a thing. And if obviously I'm going to be playing tons of World vs. World with the guild during the actual guild events in the evenings. But, uh, 
I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be exploring. I love exploring the world and I, 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 I want to have essentially something mechanical that keeps me hooked while I'm exploring and trying to check out the lore of the world. Because if I go to world versus world and structured PvP and learn my classes inside and out in those, then leveling up in the regular world becomes a chore, right? Because you're not getting anything new. You already know everything you need to know. So anyway, uh, I don't even know if this is something that we can f- access, but I'd love to know if, how close we can get on this question. How many active players are we going to see in week one? How many people are going to be signed up at that point? This, just just throw a number like out there. Uh, subscription base, I would say... Do I win something if I get within a million? <laughs> sure. I'll get <laughs> you a, a Charlie. Million. <laughs> All right. So, uh, million subscribers. On I week one, on beta. week one of, well, actually, there isn't a week of beta. Shoot. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to, all right, all right. You heard it now. I'm going to guess five million, subs- or not subscribers, but five million active, active players on week one. All right. I'm going to say this is a tough one. It's really hard to gauge because I live I in this Arena, world. Arena Net's got to be sweating right now. They just. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, well, they're like, not... come on. We need these guys to think we're going to do well because they're the analysts. They know all the things on the podcast. So, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm – it's tough because I live in this bubble where everybody I know – is like, yeah, Guild Wars 2, Guild Wars 2, yeah, Guild Wars 2. But then I also know yeah. people who live outside that bubble that are like, what? No, um, maybe. And I know those people are going to get it eventually. They're going to get it eventually. They're gonna, the hype is going to hit them. And they're going to be like, Star Wars, what? And, and they're going to play Guild Wars 2. I just know that's going to happen. But how long is it going to take? Is it going to be right away? Is it going to be after the beta? I think... Oh, that's very tough. I You'll think love 4 this, million. Bridger. Mianhe in chat... Uh says there's going to be one million because there will be a queue. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, I'm saying four million. Vega. Are we doing Price is Right style here? Or <laughs> we... That's a very good question. We because have to establish so, the rules of the game. No, let's just do regular, closest period. Um, I am going to say... Uh... Four and a half million. I knew you were going to take 4.5. <laughs> I knew it. All right, Kai, you can pick um, what they pick too and win with them if you want. Or, me. <laughs> or you can um, just say above 5 million or below 4 million. <laughs> I think, oh, God, 5 million seems like a lot of people. It That's does. Like, isn't that like the population of London? Like, Everyone in London Probably. would have to buy the game. That's, well, you have that to consider there, there was at some point like 10 or 12 million people subscribed actively to WoW throughout the world. So we're talking yeah. worldwide is what I should say. Worldwide Guild Wars 2. Okay, I think 3.5 million. All right. Disclaimer is none of us here have economic or marketing degrees. So. Or <laughs> any inside access. <laughs> yes. But that's call, the idea. Call. This is why, that's why this, called, this, is, this segment's called Prophecies. It's not called um, uh, insider trading Hard estimates. research. Hard research <laughs> that you can depend upon. Yeah, we are not lawyers, etc. All right, so now we've got a good set of data. And so what I plan to do is for the show, the fourth show after the release, basically a month after release, we're going to revisit this and see if we can examine and see who was right on all of these. It'll be a fun little uh, experiment. So we're kind of running out of time. I got one more topic we can cover here. Um, what would you like to see in the collector's edition? Ooh, I like this topic. Mm. All right, why don't you give us a start? Um, I would like to see a CD of all the game soundtracks that I can maybe like listen to to like go to sleep or like you know I'm just cleaning and pretending I'm playing Guild Wars 2 like when I have to do that other stuff like I can play the music and feel like I'm playing I would also like a mouse mat a Guild Wars 2 mouse mat maybe with like all the races and um, a poster that's what I want maybe an in-game pet as well a poster <laughs> What? What's wrong with a poster? 
That's I like posters. I, don't, I like the posters. I would say char plushie, but I already have my char plushie, so Yeah, they better not put that in the collector's edition. I spent good money on my put... char plushie. They'll have two versions. <laughs> <laughs> they have to give us like a Silvari or, or an Asura plushie. Yeah. If it was a Silvari <laughs> plushie, man, that'd be amazing. That'd really But anything, really, I believe in Arena Net and I'll get the collector's edition anyway. All right, what do you think, Freelancer? I know you're getting the collector's edition. What do you, what do you think's going to be in there? I'll be getting a couple of them, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, it's one of the things, you know, you buy a couple, well, I do, maybe it's, I'm just a weird nerd like that, but I buy a couple and then I sell them later for, um, <laughs> buy collector's well, editions, question mark, profit. Well, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like how I work in the auction house, but, um, <laughs> it's all right. Well, let's, let's see. A CD is nice, but who actually listens to the CDs? Come on. It's nothing you can't find online. I'm sorry, Kai, but it, you'll, you'll be able to instantly find all of those songs online. I guess I think in a more practical sense, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's true. But it's, it's, it's I like, could get yeah. this stuff for free, Arena Net. What are you doing to me? Give me something <laughs> hard here. What, what am I going to get in this collector's edition that I, I won't be able to download or, or you know, get Pride. software? Pride that you spent more money on this than other people did. <laughs> uh, I would like I to see. I, I, and I am going to get so much hate for this, I'm sure, but I would like to see in game stuff. It's nice to have the art book because that's something you, I guess you could put on your shelf. I mean, I have a whole nerd out uh, bookshelf behind me here. Um, but it's. I would like to see maybe like a title, an in game title. Maybe a. Dedicated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> dedicated. The collector. Or, uh, or just like, like, like something about rolling in money because you can afford the hundred dollar collector's edition or something. I don't Deep know. It, 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 I guess it's just I'll, I'll get the collector's edition because I always do. I'm a sucker, but it's uh, the in-game stuff. Like my StarCraft II, I'll show you guys this. This has never been opened. Okay, StarCraft II collector's edition never been opened. Why? I don't even know. <laughs> okay, I have it. I've never opened it. It's probably worth a decent amount of money, but um, you know, it's like, what's the point? I, now, what did I get from buying this? I got a nice little pre-beta code so I can get early access uh, to the beta when it was going on. I got a um, little in-game avatar and stuff. I mean, that's pretty cool, and I enjoyed that. Um, the stuff, the rest of the stuff that's in here, I didn't really care about. So maybe I'm the wrong person to ask about this. <laughs> Actually, I like Zezer's idea. A Guild War 2 themed risk, wrist cooler pillow thing to fight the carpal tunnel you'll be getting from playing too much Guild Wars 2. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, <laughs> yeah, here's some, here's some uh, icy hot for your wrist. <laughs> All right, so... I, I kind of like would like to see in-game type things too. Uh, what somebody else I saw suggested... Um, in one of the threads, I don't know if it was on Reddit or somewhere, uh, would be, you know, the, we know that you're not going to get enough character slots to make one of every class with the main game. I think that's something that they've said is going to be uh, sort of an aftermarket item, as it were. You're going to get, like, say, four or five character slots, and if you want extra character slots, you can buy them in the microtransaction store, which is how Guild Wars 1 worked. And what I would like to see is the collector's edition would come with more character slots by default. I think that would be really useful. And maybe some other kind of, uh, you know, useful in-game things. Like maybe a title, maybe some... I mean, cool-looking armor doesn't go so far because there's going to be huge amounts of people with the collector's edition. So that doesn't make you unique at all. But maybe some, like, dyes. Maybe some cool dyes that are hard to find or hard to get. You just get access to them at all your characters that from level one instead of having to try and find them or, or you know, unlock them or whatever. D dyes would be really neat. I think that'd yeah, be really or or something. I don't know. All right, Vega. Anything to add? What do you think we're missing here? A pony um, should have come well, with a the, pony. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Guild Wars One. They had the thing that um, whenever you did like a dance or an action or something, your hands glowed or something in game like that. I like in game stuff yes, as long emotes, as long as of course as long as it's like cosmetic things. I like that. I think that's kind of cool. Um, but Guild Wars One Collector's Edition came with a headset. I don't know if anyone remembers really? that. Really? Yeah. Um, it came with a headset with a mic and everything. It, granted, it wasn't like very good quality, but it still came with a headset. Um, I'm a sucker for little figurines. Um, I like the idea of a mouse pad. I mean, I got my I got my D3 one here, um, so I'd appreciate a Guild Wars 2 one. Um, <laughs> but, I'm using um, the same mouse pad I have had since, uh, let's see. This must be... 
The Intel Extreme Gaming Experience. This this thing has been used and abused. This, I think, must be from the 2005 or 2006 uh, championships for CPL or something like that. But it's it's massive. I like it. <laughs> everybody, yeah, this I is like, the I everybody like... show your mouse pads. Yeah, but I, I like I like the idea of in-game stuff. You know, like cosmetic things that you know are kind of cool. Um, but I think it'd be cool to have a little like char figurine or um, I don't know a poster or something. I like the little collectible things. But see, that's I the one thing I'm I would throw out. I just I don't care. I, oh, I like wow. those things. I got my what? Deathwing right here too. My my oh. death. Well, this this is from BlizzCon, but my little I, Deathwing. I just I love these I, things. Yeah, but are you guys like? Would you buy a char plushie like? I'm a pragmatist. I, mean, I, know, I just you put your wife one, didn't you? I bought but her one because she cares. She, you should see our living room. How many shelves of Final Fantasy figures she has? <laughs> we don't need any more crap. Really, it's just decorations. <laughs> I don't really it's need nice, it. It's nice, Like you'll show your grandkids. You're them like a you know, I made a podcast about this game, and like this is a figurine from the game. Like that's cool. I love that stuff. Yeah, whatever, Grandpa. I want to go play <laughs> PlayStation 17 now. <laughs> With real 4D. All right. I think, uh, I think we've hit our time limit here, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, any final thoughts? Someone said a hug from Reese Summersby. That's yes, a good one. Yes, that should be in the box. I want a hug. <laughs> <laughs> I got a quick question for you. Do you think it's right or wrong to allow a pre-order, a collector's edition, to give a two-day head start? And Guild Wars 2. Ooh. Wrong. I think it's wrong. Wrong. Oh, I oh. I so you're I saying, wait, hang on, let me clarify. Here, but... Let me clarify. What you're saying is the collector's edition gets a head start, but the regular pre orders don't. A Aeon, which I'm, I'm guilty, guys. I have Aeon's collector's edition right there. Um, Aeon provided a one day, like if you pre ordered, you had two day head start. Okay. If you had a collector's edition or their special edition, um, you got a one extra day. So you had a, basically a three-day head start. Wait a minute. Now, if you the pre-order, the game comes out earlier? For Aeon, it did, yes. But doesn't so, that mean that the release date is literally just two days earlier because when you order it, the release date changes for you? Like, for me, the <laughs> release date is the third, but when I pre-order it, it becomes the first. So anybody who ever plays the game will be able to play it on the first, therefore it actually comes out on the first. But it doesn't hit shelves until the third. Okay. I, unless you went to GameStop, unless you went to GameStop at midnight or you got it from Amazon, you didn't pre-order and get your code or anything. You were playing on that day it actually started. But everybody else was already in the servers for two or three days before you. So the question is, real quick, to wrap this up, is that right or is it wrong to pay more money to have early access? Wrong. See, Kai keeps saying wrong. <laughs> um, like, I'll I'm, I'm, in, a bit. I'm indifferent. I'm indifferent, but if it came with the collectors, I'd still play it a couple days early. Yeah, I would but... play it if I got it, but I just think it's a horrible idea. Like, if I was one of these people that, like, you know, I'm going to have to save to buy the collector's edition. Like, I'm a student. Like, I will have to save. And, um, like, I think it's wrong that these people who, like, are actually, like, mature and they work and they can afford just to buy as many pets editions as they want, <laughs> like, they can, they can they get a head start on me. And Who's that's rich like, bastards? <laughs> they get I... wealthy world. Like, if that happens before then, you know, their server's already a better server because, you know, they've got people... The who rich server things. is going to have an advantage. Exactly. That's an interesting and thought. Then... Now I'd they're... much rather I'd much rather have, um, if you pre-order or get collectors, you get access to a beta weekend. I'd yeah, much I'd rather have, have that than like a couple days. Their their mentality behind this, they may have just done this to save grace or whatever it might have been, but they were saying that in the in the long run that the reason they did it was not to get more pre-orders, but to balance out server loads, people logging on, so that they didn't have a mass influx of players on day one. Um, if you ask me, I think that was a load of BS, but <laughs> I mean it does make sense in a way, you know, to have staggered. Um, uh, did not Star Wars do that? I believe they did. They had we a had... guild launch that people who were with, that were with yeah. organized guilds were able to get in a little bit earlier too, and they also had an early launch before the actual launch too. Now, to me, I think if they did something like that, I think it does make sense 
from a technological point of view. You don't want everybody logging onto all the servers at the same exact moment. If you have some kind of a staggered release like that, that could probably help them out a lot to have no major launch difficulties. That having been said, if they're gonna do that, World versus World must be shut down until the day the, day the game comes out for the reasons yeah. that Kai said. And just because you don't want to, to, to force people to buy a collector's edition to be there at the ground floor of that kind of a thing. Everybody's going to be able to level up through the, uh, through the world in the dynamic events and have the same experience. There's only one time in the entire history of the game that World vs. World is going to be starting at level 1 and nothing's happened. And later on, everybody's going to be level 80, and then it's going to have its own set metagame. But that first time is going to be a unique experience, and forcing people to pay an extra 30 or 40 or 50 or whatever dollars to get that unique experience, I think that's not cool. Unless they start World versus World on, you know, a little later in the week. Maybe like a week after launch or something when everything's like steadied out, the servers yeah. are fine and things like that. Like that's, that's I might be annoyed by that, but if that's what they have to do to keep a good launch, then that's what they have to do to keep a good launch. It's better than launching Oof. at a staggered release and having, you know, not everybody able to get into the World versus World when it starts. The chat room really want me and Freelancer to like hate each other. Earlier they were like, I want to see Freelancer in Kai PvP. Now they're like, who's going to be the better guild leader? <laughs> That's right. Oh man, I should just put a big versus across the center of the screen. <laughs> Bridger versus Vega, Kai versus Freelancer. Turn in tonight in the cage match to end all cage matches. <laughs> <laughs> and we just went to pro wrestling, I so I think that means those, it's uh, time. Those bear ears she has on is kind of intimidating, Bridger. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that I think the pro wrestling means it's time to end the show. Thanks everybody for tuning in. This has been another fantastic Tales of Tyria. If you feel like helping us out, there's a donation button on the right-hand side of the page there. Just scroll down a little bit. If you have any good ideas for us, feedback at talesoftyria.com is where you can find us. I am Bridger. Freelancer, Kai and Vega join me tonight for episode number 18, ladies and gentlemen. 18 episodes. And, uh, that's a lot. That's, that's season one. Hopefully, when we get into one of these beta events, season one is a wrap. And when we get into beta, that's season two. When the game launches, season three of Tales of Tyria begins, and that is the real Tales of Tyria. So you're not going to want to miss it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Have a good night. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thanks for coming.